Well, welcome everyone to another edition of Taking Stock Live, where we do just that. We take stock as we have for many years in the retail and consumer goods industry. But in this twist of things, we're taking stock of what's new, what are the trends, and really what are some of the predictions from thought leaders around the world in this space that we love so much. Today is going to be really fun because I get to introduce and interview someone that I've always admired. I'll be honest, I was kind of scared of her in my days at The Gap, but she is undoubtedly a futurist, a thought leader, but grounded in sort of what we can learn from East to West, but also what's pragmatic for the retail industry. So Deb Weinswig, who really needs no introduction, she's the CEO and founder of Coresight Research. And I'll tell you the reason I was scared of her is because back in the days when I was at The Gap, she was the lead analyst and she was the person we would prep for um, for when we would do our earnings calls, always with the best questions, always pushing us harder than we were pushing ourselves. So um, we've now, over the years, become friends and um, just super we're grateful for that friendship. So Deb, you know everything there is to know about retail. You're always on the cutting edge and you're amazing with customers. Let's uh, let's go back in time and uh, maybe tell us a little bit how you got into this industry of retail. What was your first job in retail? Well, it's actually funny. I have to say I my first job was uh, I had a paper route. <laughs> that was like wow. my first job. I actually built a <laughs> paper route empire and called in like the kids I babysat to also help me with like my paper route empire. So that was like the first, first job. I then, from a retail perspective, uh, I put myself through college working at a Sears telecatalog center. Wow. And even though I had minimal, let's say practical work experience because of my interest in technology, they, I was a supervisor and had like a team of like 180 people. And I was there, the one trying to figure out, right, when you couldn't get the blinds to go through, you know, kind of, right, this is all basically early days, almost of telecatalog, which is modern day e-commerce. How did we kind of, you know, figure out the system, basically to hack it so we could get the blinds order to go through and whatnot. And it was really interesting. I spent a lot of time with uh, very unhappy customers and made them happy customers, but tried to figure out what that path was. And I learned a lot about retail, technology, and then really about the consumer, what they wanted, and ultimately how to have a very happy consumer. <laughs> wow. Telecatalog. That is a frame. It took, I had a minute. <laughs> It took me a minute to even understand uh, what it was, but the thought of you working, working the phones and helping people with, with their blinds, um, I would, I would pay a lot of money to see that today. You obviously <laughs> skyrocketed from a paper route that to uh, your job really at, uh, in the financial world to where you are at Coresight. Maybe tell us a little bit about that path. So I, I was always in it. I mean, honestly, it, went from like the very beginning, I was always very curious. And hey, maybe I read a lot of those papers on Sunday mornings as I was sitting there. Um, but I, I was always incredibly curious. And right there, they're like the four boxes. And I was always the one who asked why, right? Like, why does this happen? Why does it matter? How do we connect the dots? How do we get from here to there? And when I was in business school, I, you know, I realized I was literally like an N of one, because I was always trying to kind of figure out, you know, like why are we taking these classes and why they matter? And so I spent my summer in equity research. I was probably one of the, I actually think I was the only one. And then I, I was like, this is just purpose built for, for me. And I had like the very quantitative, but also the qualitative and trying to put the two together. And I ended up, uh, I was very blessed. I went to work at Morgan Stanley as a strategist upon graduation. And there you got to ask why all the time. And so it was, you know, you were kind of like, a mile wide and like an inch deep because we were, I was, I was a global strategist as well. And so got to travel around the world asking our analysts why it was like the best role I could have ever asked for. And I had interned at one of the banks in retail. And when I was then looking for a sector, I, I returned back to retail and ultimately ended up leading the, the global consumer team at Citigroup. And we, what I truly loved, I mean, I really, as you said, I loved getting the nitty gritty of the stocks where I want to understand the numbers and re really understand them sequentially. So right quarter over quarter and year over year, and then looking at things on like a two year and three year stack to really kind of pull out trends. But then I worked with our broader global team on big thematic pieces of research. And I had the 
unique distinction to, to be at City during the global financial crisis or the GFC. And so I will tell you, as I said, right, the best work gets done during a bear market. We did some really good work. And I learned so much about the team, how to, you know, kind of pull information together. And it was, it, it was just, I, I just, I learned every day. And that's what I still do. I mean, Shelly, you're just, you know, you're, you're also incredibly curious. I mean, the fact that we get to learn in our jobs every day, I mean, we couldn't be luckier. I know, it's true. And one of the things that I really have always admired about you is that you you do have that ask why and curiosity, but you also have this ability to then like ground it, like you said, in the numbers. Like you have a great mix of that qual qualitative curiosity, but then quantitative grounding which I think probably is, I'll, I'll speculate, has led you to where you are now with Coresight. But maybe for all, all the people out there that aren't reading some of your reports, and here's a plug for, for Coresight, um, tell, tell everyone a little bit about what you're, you're up to as, as a CEO of Coresight. Yeah, so, you know, as, as Shelley said earlier, this whole idea of kind of learning from the East and, and you know, really manifesting it in research in the West. So practical, if you will, applications for really the, the C-suite and what we're seeing. So we, we have, we track a lot of data, anything from store openings and closings to management changes to, you know, anything that really can be, be tracked. And looking at that over kind of like a time series and seeing if there's anything that's, that's predictive, we have kind of a, like a whole AI lever, layer and, and algorithms that are helping us kind of, I would say, pull out any, any variances or where you're like, well, that's interesting. I hadn't expected that. And so then going back to the why, like, why is it like that? And let's write, you know, kind of a, a detailed piece of research. So we do a lot of what we call deep dives, where we take a topic or a theme and really kind of, you know, look at it soup to nuts. A think tank piece, which is, you know, that's like we did a big one on the adaptive market. So, you know, if you look at the U.S., you know, 40 million people identify themselves as, you know, kind of being disabled. That's a huge market that most retailers aren't making product for right now. And so we look at it as just a huge opportunity from a dollars and cents perspective. So it goes back to, you know, making this very practical and going, you know, also on the, the live streaming, live commerce side, you know, this being an $11 billion market expected this year in the U.S. and $300 billion in China. And if we look at the data so far to date, right, you know, kind of Tmall has seen 90% growth. We're expecting 100%. So we're pretty much right on track with the expectation we had at the beginning of the year. But I think it's going back to you know that very big picture and, and looking at the data, pulling out kind of what seems to be, you know, let's just say maybe a, a data pattern that we hadn't expected. And then boiling down to the practical, like I said, when you look at live commerce, you look at the adaptive market, loyalty, right? You know, these are these are some of the huge opportunities that, and community, right, that we have right now that I think retailers, it's it's in their purview. This isn't, you know, kind of, this is future thinking, but we can kind of start to make a difference today. And I think that's not only in terms of, you know, touching the consumer's heart, but also laying out a game plan so that we're successful in the next three to five years. You must have been eavesdropping in a <laughs> meeting I had with a major retailer yesterday. Literally, we were talking about, you know, servicing sort of the uh, the population who have seen and unseen disabilities. We were talking about live stream commerce and we were talking about loyalty. So, uh, <laughs> but um, so, I mean, those are obviously three biggies that I would imagine you're seeing are top of mind for many of the brands you're talking to in the U.S. and, and globally. Will, will you go a bit deeper on some of them in terms of what you're what you're really hearing from customers and where you think the thought leadership is? We had an inclusive design conference back in 2018. Okay. That was around adaptive and let's call it extended sizes. And what was amazing is we we you know we put it together very quickly and we had standing room only. And I'm like, wow, there's something here. And we were really starting to, I would say develop this this idea especially around adaptive but also if you think about globally and so i think that's a very important point right we are seeing you know uh trends around the you know upper end of the the size continuum and when we think about the fact that most brands stop at a 14 but that's the average size of the consumer there's a lot there that i i i i think from a whether it's in, in diversity and inclusion it's just we have to think practically from a retail perspective, 
right? It's all about sales. If you're leaving out half the market, your sales are already half of what they possibly could be. So let's just talk practically. To develop product for an adaptive consumer, for an extended size consumer on, on either end of the size spectrum, that's just top line and bottom line opportunity. If we look at loyalty, if you think about, right, especially in a day and age where we have, you know, consumers who are probably in physical stores less, how do we reach out to them kind of beyond the physical store? And whether that's through live commerce, right, which is a new channel or newish, or through e-commerce. And, you know, there could be a gamification element, right? Like you visit a store, you go into our live stream, you're in, you know, kind of our, our e-com site, right? And, and you know, you, you qualify for something. There, there's a whole angle around that. And, and one thing I have to say that's been so interesting and so different than what we're seeing anywhere else in the world, in live commerce in the United States, where we're seeing retailers either it's like every Thursday or every day, that consumers are coming every day, every Thursday, because they want to be part of that community. And that is something very unique to the U.S. I, I have to say it's something I've really been spending a lot of time thinking about, Shelly, because right, we're all trying to connect with each other. And if we can do it in that, that medium or that channel, there's a huge opportunity there for retail. We just have to, you know, you and I have to put our heads together to think about what that yeah. means. But, but it's a huge opportunity. That's so interesting. Do you think, because I have to be honest, like, uh, I, 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 for live stream commerce, some of my job sometimes is to sort of filter the shiny objects from like what's real and meaningful for, for retailers. And I knew it was a big trend in, in China, but I wasn't sure how it was going to be adopted. It feels like we're, we're really tipping in, in the U.S. and in, in, in Europe, I'm curious, um, on, on live stream commerce. But this notion of community, do you think that's related to people wanting more community in general or wanting to feel like you're in a store? Or what do you think that's about? And, and that's and that, why is it different maybe in the West versus the East? I mean, some of it may be this, this passion around product and yeah. that, right, if you have, right, we all kind of associate ourselves, right, with certain brands or as we're discovering new brands. And if we maybe find, you know, and a lot of these brands now are right purpose built. So if we can find others who have that same feeling about this, this purpose built brand or the DNA of the brand, I, I think there is that that idea around connecting. And it is interesting going back to live commerce. I will tell you, I probably talk to a retail at least once a day who's like, is this gonna really be something here in the US? And I'm like, it is really something. I think the challenges are the uh, consumer journey right now. So you're not like on your phone watching a live commerce and you're like, boop, I'm buying it. The, the, the boop part isn't happening yet. This is, so another really interesting stat, two thirds, well, let's say between 67 and 74%. So let's go with two thirds of consumers buy after the stream. Which after? After, and so the huh. idea is that they're looking for that. So I think that they're joining the stream to have this community and to be with yeah. others. And to, right, because you're asking the, you know, the host or the creator questions and right there, they're educating you on the product. But then we're going to the, you know, to the website of the retailer. And so the good news is, right, then we're continuing that journey from a loyalty perspective, if we think about that. And they're then watching the stream again, in most cases, and then buying because the products during that stream are associated with the stream. So it's a very interesting journey. And if you think about the fact that, from a customer acquisition cost perspective, if they're being acquired through a stream, it's a very, very, very inexpensive way to acquire a customer, considering the, the cost to be on these live stream platforms is uh, usually in the hundreds of dollars a month. It is the best ROI that you are going to have as a brand. Huh. A lot cheaper than acquiring the, the, the other ways uh, with some of our competitors, other ways of acquiring customers through search and other other digital advertising. Are there are there categories where you're seeing digital street, like commerce and live stream commerce take off more quickly than others within within the segment within retail? The stats would show that fashion is number one. Beauty is number two. Beauty makes a lot more sense to me because right there's the the ingredients the you know efficacy understanding how to put it on and one thing that we haven't you know and food also is is growing it's the fastest growing category in china it's fascinating right and especially these kind of tier four and five cities we've seen farmers who are now celebrities for all intensive uses of the the word 
and 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 they are building a brand. I think that's what's really interesting. So it could be right, like Shelly's tangerines, and I and I only want to buy Shelly's tangerines. So it's giving these farmers number one, uh, I would say, control right over their businesses, and they are able to sell much more. They are able to also have right, like Shelly's tangerines T-shirts and stuff like that, because it's completely changing the way that we think about commerce. And it's not just right, you know, if we think about why this is also very inexpensive and this is really important, you want to use either right the founders or your store associates. So it's not about paying celebrities and, and creators, right? That goes back to why this is a very kind of strong ROI piece of your business, because you're having the people who are passionate about the product talk to the customers and who better to answer questions, right? If, Think about, you know, whether it's apparel and it's like, well, is that like a, a light purple or dark purple? Oh, it's a light purple. Well, what can I wear with that? And like literally people will run, especially the live streams, but even in the store or at home, you'll have product, right? There's there's oftentimes two people on a stream. So somebody else can run and bring, oh, these would be pants that would go great and these shoes. And so it's this whole idea that you can literally create an entire outfit in a very short period of time. So from a customer perspective, it's also a great use of their time and they feel like they're getting one-on-one -on -one attention, but everyone is benefiting from that conversation and then going on their own consumption journey. So cool. And it does feel um, like such an incredible storytelling and connection with the brand. And as you unpack it, you said apparel, cosmetics, and then cooking, those all like so, so, so personal. Um, and uh, just the, just, uh, you know, in my shoes, like I think about the data <laughs> that you can collect and learn from and then help uh, personalize it. So, it's 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 exciting the data is really key too because you can also find right when people are dropping out of the stream huh. or if you have what's called like a koc like a key opinion customer somebody who you know let's just say has a lot of you know friends through social media and they can be like well you've got to join the stream right i'm learning all about how to do like my hair in this new way and those right those pieces of data along the way and then also just in terms of looking at the sales Right. When are they happening in the stream? How much is happening afterwards? And then, right, this idea of anonymized consumer data. Right. What you know, where is this person geographically? What time of right are people on at three in the morning? Those types right, that can really, once again, incredibly inexpensive way for retailers to know more about their customer, how to service them and how to win, really. Wow, that, it's really exciting, and um, I really appreciate you taking the time to sort of unpack what it is and what it could be, and and sort of how people are engaging around the world. And this community aspect, I think we have to really, as you said, put our heads together on. Are there is there anything else that you're seeing, particularly in China, that you think is really important for sort of the Western retailers and brands to pay attention to? You know, it's interesting on the sustainability side, we, you know, my team there, I remember, you know, this is a few years ago, they're like, we're all going to go out on the weekend together and like pick up trash. And I was like, well, how is that being organized? And so there were literally kind of message boards where there was this idea that people were coming together to kind of, you know, have an impact on the environment. And we've seen that with the green finance. And now many of the, the retailers, they're sharing information, I would say in a way, to benefit everybody and and that idea because also too it's like well i'm doing this well i'm doing this well how can i do that and so there's there's also i don't want to say it's it's it is one upping but it's this idea right i can learn from them to, to do better by my consumers and to do better by the environment but they're also saving money right that's the that is actually i think the the kind of key focus also from a sustainability perspective is right utilizing less working together and thinking about how to save energy, utilize product and also people in ways that that is ultimately more sustainable. And so we are seeing, right, we've seen this big move into also like clean beauty and the growth there. And, and then also just completely new categories, right, around health and wellness. Um, so like ingestible beauty in an 18 month period became a $3.4 billion market where people are ingesting like jelly bird's nests that have collagen in them. So there's some new sectors, but I think a lot of this did stem from a lot of the work in sustainability and, and thinking about new ways to make product. And so I, I think that that's right, clean beauty, this ingestible beauty, I mean, all of these new ways to approach the consumer. And, and I think we're still very early on the path. So I, I feel like there's this opportunity to, to kind of come together in the West around a topic like sustainability, but to share what we're learning 
and you know very openly and then as a result we can think about new products new processes and what's important to the consumer ultimately i mean i had i had a client ask me right if i put a hang tag on that says right you know kind of you know sustainable this that, and the other they're like is it sustainable to put a hang tag on and i'm like you know these those are good questions and i'm like it's so there, there are a lot of questions but i think if retailers could ask other retailers how they're thinking about it that would right because this retailer is spending a lot of time so i'm like we just want to move forward right you've got a great sustainable pair of jeans let's get them out into the market and i think you know maybe you put use like qr codes or whatnot but there are a lot of questions that retailers have right now. If we can get them answered in a very efficient manner, right? I think we can all be a bit more sustainable and the consumers really, you know, they, they take that to heart. And especially going back to this community aspect, they're, they're sharing that information, I would say, very quickly in their communities. Well, I mean, it's so interesting. And um, to your point, like we, we've known for a long time, there's a lot of waste in our industry. And I, I think the new consumer cares a lot about the, the future of our planet. And so it's driving, to your point though, um, real product innovation and new category innovation and this ingestible beauty. Like, uh, you know, I think it's super, super interesting, inspired by nature and, and, and the planet. So um, as we sort of start to think about, you know, the peak season that many of our customers are, are looking down at and then looking forward to, what sort of, um, you know, top three pieces of advice would you give retailers and brands um, for the rest of this year? Mm, this, this is, it's funny. Last year, we, you know, we at Corsite started our own, you know, kind of global shopping festival called Pen 10 to pull forward the, the holiday season. And a lot of that was around some of the supply chain disruptions. This year, you know, I, I thought that last year was going to be the year of, you know, let's just call it supply chain disruptions. I, I didn't think that we could possibly see a year more challenging. And once again, my supply chain background from, from my days at Liam Fung, I mean, we probably got a four to six quarter challenge to kind of move through this because it's everything, right? I mean, it's the factories, it's the you know, kind of making sure the product is organic and being able to get access to enough materials. It's shipping, it's containers, it's trucking, it's 3PL space. I mean, it is every single kind of piece of the, the supply chain that I could identify is, is challenged right now. So I, I would say that if I were to give three pieces of advice, have nine backup plans on supply chain. And also, one thing that we're starting to do is look at on-demand manufacturing here in the United States. And so think about, and, and some of that can also be customized and personalized. So there, there just may be a whole, and this goes back to sustainability as well, right? Because if we're only making product, so think about it, you have a live streamer in a, one of these on-demand locations, and you know they're streaming, and someone buys a pair of jeans with, let's say, kind of, I don't know, um, flowers on them. And then that's sent to the on-demand manufacturing, uh, you know, kind of location. You can literally have those jeans made in a period of about an hour, picked, packed, and shipped. So the entire process could take two and a half, three hours, depending on where the customer is geographically. They could have that the same day. And I, I feel like what we're learning this year is, you know, maybe maybe because we're being pushed into it. It's some of these sustainable business practices, but I, I do think that will be really critical. We are seeing you know, retailers look at, you know, kind of dark stores to also even just store merchandise, right? This kind of buy online, pick up in store and, you know, kind of the, these new ways of the consumer engaging. And so whether it's last mile, whether it's, so it's like first mile, middle mile, last mile. And I think the biggest challenges we're actually seeing right now in some ways are that middle mile. And it, we are all working together, right, to, to figure out what, what the new technologies are, processes. And so I think that this is a huge opportunity for all of us to come together because new technology will will kind of really grow from this. So that's one, supply chain. Number two, I think that the ability to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with your customers and this idea that you can help them make, you know, quick, right, There, there is this decision fatigue. I mean, Shelly, you and I have talked about this that people are having right now. And so if we can help them with their you know, thinking about their list, making sure they have their whole list, right? And if we start to do this, let's say in October, 
And let's say they have a list of 20 people who they want to kind of, you know, purchase something for over the holiday season, that they're thinking about that early. And, that, you know, there, there might be new ways to, to engage with the customer, a personalized message, a personalized product. But I do think this idea of one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, we are seeing one-to-many through live commerce, but the one-on-one -on -one is, is really helping to kind of get the, the transactions formalized and to also really give back, whether you're a luxury customer or whether you're a discount store shopper, I do think that one-on-one -on -one has a role everywhere. And you can just get those questions answered in a way that, you know, you're comfortable, maybe if it's a sensitive question or if, if you're more comfortable shopping from home or, or the beach or the moon, wherever it might be, we, we want to make sure that that person is, is comfortable. And then number three, I think is your employees, your staff, your associates, and, and how you're taking care of them, whether it's their, their mental health needs, whether it's a, a lot of it's around information, right? That's what we're hearing right now is that there is this desire by the, you know, kind of, if you will, the, the frontline associates to make sure that they know, right, what's dropping when, what are the questions that the consumers have been asking, how do I answer them, right, what's the, what are best practices right now, and since we're all, you know, I would say growing every day, we are hearing that this opportunity, because your associates are, right, they love your product, they love your store, let them share that with the consumers, but we have to make sure that we have a, a mechanism to, to share out that information, and so, you know, I would say personally, once again, you know, we at CoreSight use Teams and it has literally changed our life, Shelly, in terms of being able to communicate around the world 24-7. Everyone has to figure out what's right for them, but that truly has made a significant difference for us. So I, I want to thank you and thank Microsoft for, for really changing our approach to, to, you know, to communication. But right now, it, it is really, you know, incredibly important, anyone who's customer facing. So I would say those are the three key messages and, you know, they're all quite weighty, but as much as retailers can do in terms of addressing each one, I think will make a big difference this holiday season. Wow. That is like a, everybody will be re watching and rewatching that those three <laughs> tips, I think, on this. We'll watch, we'll watch the analytics, but, um, you know, this idea of, um, you know, certainly the supply chain, but on-demand merchandising and <laughs> the nine backup plans. Um, I really agree. Number two, in terms of you know personalization and one to one with customers, and I think we are seeing you know even and I never thought I would say this um, you know with even some of the bot technologies, uh, we're seeing that some consumers would actually prefer to like do their list and get advice from a bot versus a live person, and that creates this one to one and and kind of personalization paradigm. And then this third around your employees. And I could thank you for the, the plug on Teams. I think we're thrilled to see it, you know, becoming sort of the backbone for, for folks like you and me. I think the big opportunity to your point is how we get that to 85% of the workforce in the front line of retail, where they can have the same sort of collaboration and, and insight about products that you and I um, get to have. So, um, wow, thank you so much. I knew this was gonna be great. It definitely beat my expectations. I think you and I could have gone on for a lot longer, but a huge thank you, Deb, for being with us today. Thank you, Shelly, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and for all of you out there, uh, thanks for tuning in. I know you'll find this as interesting as I did. And we always love to get your feedback, what you want to hear more of, topics we didn't hit, um, and anything else that will help us make this the best content for all of you. So thanks again for joining another edition of Taking Stock Live, and we'll see you in the next edition. Thank you. Thank you.